Father God, thank you for your presence with us this morning as we have worshipped together, as we prayed together. Uh, Thank you for the way that you've impacted so many people's lives already this morning. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you're still present, still active, still caring, still powerful among us now as we come and look at your living word. Father God, I ask that you will speak to us this morning as we look at your word together. As I often pray that we're not just going to gain information, but going to gain some revelation about you, the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are continuing uh, this new series that I'm doing, uh, looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. If you've not found it, I do strongly recommend the index. It's a very handy way of finding books. If you happen to have one of our church Bibles in front of you, uh, we're going to be beginning today on page uh, 670, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. But if you've got a different Bible, uh, I do recommend the index because it's one of those books that's um, not the easiest to find. And it's a book that you may never have looked at. In fact, it's a book that a lot of Christians have never looked at. It's regarded by many as being one of the strangest books in the Bible. As I've said each introduction, I really enjoy reading this book. It's one of my favorite parts of the Old Testament. It asks really tough questions about life. It asks questions that a lot of people prefer not to look at. Questions to undermine uh, people's confidence in uh, human wisdom, undermine confidence in money, undermine confidence in possessions, in human pleasure, in human justice. It, it, it underlines how actually how frail and fragile people's lives really are and how important it is to seize the day, to seize the moments. Because you never know whether this moment, this day, may be the last one that God blesses you with an opportunity to serve him here on this earth or not. It's a book that's really relevant as well because it challenges many of the values of the cultures in which we live and we're going to look at some of that again today. And if you want more about the background to this book on our website, you will find the uh, this series. This is part three uh, and you go back to part one and at the beginning of part one there is an introduction to this book and something about its background and history and maybe who wrote it and so on. So that's all there. I'm not going to repeat any of that this morning. Okay, I last looked at this book with you two weeks ago. If you were here two weeks ago, wave at me. Fantastic. Okay, you know what's coming now? If you're here in my teaching for the first time, by the way, I should explain that I'm a little unusual in that not only do I ask questions, I actually want people to answer them. And I wander around with a microphone and listen to people. So it is genuinely interactive. And I've got a number of questions that we're going to look at uh, today as we work through this passage. Now, that's going to be a bit more challenging today, particularly if you're sitting right in the middle and you put your hand up uh, for me to come to you with a mic. But we'll see how we get on with that. It could be interesting. So here's the question. What were the key things that we learned at last time? Do you remember what you turned to one another and said partway through the teaching last time. What was the key things we learned last time? <laughs> John, your hand was the first up, so I'll come to you. We're all going to die. Yeah, it was like one of those wonderful moments in Pentecostal churches uh, last week, and I said, okay, I want you to turn to one another now and say, I'm going to die. And then to turn to one another and say, And so are you. And all the embarrassed laughter that we have now, we had last time as well, because our society likes to try and pretend that that's not true. So that was one of the key things last time. Everyone is going to die. What else did we see last time? 
What were the other key things that we looked at last time? That's probably the one that's seared in your mind, but there were some others as well. I think it is last time. Um, for an evangelist, it's um, quite good because God has set within our hearts and every single person part of him, really, part of eternity. It wasn't last time. It was the time before last, but well remembered. That's right. That In, in our lives, God has set something which we might call a God-shaped blank, a God-shaped hole. It's part of eternity inside of every human being, which is why there is this searching for something more than the physical in, in human life. Yeah, but that wasn't last time. It was the time, but well remembered. Everything that man does is meaningless. Absolutely. There is this phrase, isn't there? Under the sun. And we come to it again today. Under the sun means ignoring God. It's just part of the writing here. And everything that's done under the sun actually is meaningless. It's pointless. It's got about as much substance as smoke and vapour. So, yeah. I was going to say life without God is pointless. Life without God is pointless. You could have read my notes because it actually says here... Life without God is pointless. So, the exact words. One other thing as well. One other thing from last time. Okay, it may not come straight to your mind, but it's not what happens to us in life that really matters. Because life is a mixture of stuff that we welcome, that we don't welcome. That's nice, that's nasty, that's good, that's evil. It just comes our way in life. And it's not what happens in life that matters, but how we respond to it. What, how we respond to that stuff that comes in our way in life is what really matters. Okay, well done. You've got a bigger challenge now, because I'm not preaching in two weeks. It's going to be, I think, three weeks before. So you're going to have to remember slightly longer from today. So let's begin at chapter four. We are looking at chapter, the whole of chapter four, and we're going through to verse seven of chapter five today. Slightly less than we normally look at, but the next section in chapter five is quite a long section. And there wasn't time to do that with the other bits today as well. The title for today... Um, because we don't see it on the PowerPoint anymore, is be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. And the reason that that's the title will become clear as we go through. So verses 1 to 6 of chapter 4, first of all. Again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place, is the phrase, under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Better than one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. So this chapter begins with looking at the inequality of power in our world. And... uh, Whenever you look at the news or listen to the news or read the newspaper, if it's not the first story, it'll be the second or third story, will be about oppression. It will be about, in our world, about one group of people oppressing some other group of people. It might be about the rich and the poor. It might be about those with military power and those without. It might be an ethnic divide in some context or situation. 
but you won't get very far into the news or very far into your newspaper before you come across some situation in our world of oppression. And behind oppression is the failure of people to appreciate that both the powerful and the powerless are equal in God's sight. For oppression to take place, the powerful, the oppressors, have to believe that the people that they're oppressing are worth less than they are. You can go back and read in history of situations where one group considered another group to be less than human. You can go back all sorts of court cases, all sorts of other cases. Uh, um, I don't want to highlight any particular one because there are so many and they affect every continent in the world. And uh, we as uh, English people, we have been in many contexts in the world the oppressors. But at the root of oppression behind oppression is this failure to recognize that everyone in our world, every human being in our world is equal in God's sight. Rich or poor, strong or weak, clever, not so clever, whatever ethnicity, whatever context, in God's sight they're equal. They're just as valuable. Both the oppressor and the oppressed are just as valuable. Sometimes we can sort of like flip it round and we can think that somehow the oppressors are less than human. You with me? But actually they're all equal in God's sight. So painful is looking at this oppression. And remember this was written thousands of years ago. Some things don't change, do they? So painful is this oppression. The writer wonders if death might be better than life. He comes to the conclusion that it isn't later on in Ecclesiastes. But here, looking under the sun, when he imagines that God is not there, he looks at it and thinks, it would be better to die than to go on seeing this pain in our world. And it would be even better, he says, not to be born into it in the first place and have to experience this. Remember, it's under the sun, he's writing now, as if God was not there. And then he goes on in verses 4 to 6 to look at different attitudes to work. This is so relevant to our culture today. Uh, in, uh, in the UK, in Europe, and probably throughout the world. Three attitudes he paints to work here. The first one is this idea of working in order to outdo someone else. What someone, a guy called Brown, I was reading this week, he dis- he's got this, a great phrase. He describes it as envy-inspired toil. Do you like that? Envy-inspired toil. It's people working to get ahead of someone else, to outdo someone else, whether it's climbing the corporate ladder, uh, whether it is in some other context or workplace. Their motivation, their drive is actually to get ahead, to be in front of someone else. And in our society today, I think that's normal behaviour doesn't mean it's right behavior. I'm not using the word normal to describe right. I'm using the word normal to describe the attitude that I think most people have. You might think you can disagree with me if you wish, but I think that that is probably the most common attitude to work. All about human rivalry. 
I'm shocked. Some I, I'm still. I mean, I'm you know, I'm I'm not young as a pastor. I've been a pastor a long time. I've heard lots of stories, but I'm still sometimes shocked when I'm have someone talking to me and they're explaining to me about what has gone on in their work context. Either what has happened to them or what's happened around them and they, they're coming to talk to me because they just want some wisdom from God into how to respond to this. And it's horrible. That's the first attitude. We're going to come back to that in a moment. The second attitude, again, we see it around, uh, certainly in the UK, and I think we see it in other places as well. It's uh, hands-folded idleness. It's just not worth working. Just this idea of, you know, hands-folded, bone idle, should I work? What's the point? And the same guy that wrote the envy-inspired toil phrase, he wrote this, In idleness, fools consume themselves. Think about that. In idleness, fools consume themselves. And then there is a third view of work here, which is not very common. He, again, he, same writer, he calls this modest demands inward peace and you can see it reflected in proverbs let me just read three proverbs to you and then we'll talk about what this means so proverbs is the book before ecclesiastes if you want to go backwards um, chapter 15 and verse 16 chapter 15 just three single proverbs we're going to read better a little 15 and 16 better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Chapter 16 and verse 8. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And chapter 17 and verse 1. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. So let's think about work for a moment. Let's think about ourselves. Uh, if you're not someone who is in uh, paid employment, you might want to think about people around you. And think about from the way here that the writer and the Proverbs are looking at work. What are, what are the challenges to our own attitudes to our own work from these verses. So what are the challenges today from this voice from thousands of years ago, but it's still God's living word today, that comes to us in our context today? So that is a genuine question, and I'm now looking for answers. What are the challenges for us in our context today from those attitudes to work we've seen painted there? There's more on this in the next few verses, but we'll pause there for a moment. Much thinking going on here. Are you indicating you want to speak, Doug? With just a little, a very slight wave of the hand there. That was very subtle. I hardly noticed it. Well, we have a, a, a big temptation to keep up with the latest and greatest and the newest, especially in, in com computers uh, and all kinds of paraphernalia if you're satisfied with... Uh, modest uh, gain, you can't keep up with all that. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I feel like our society, one of the values is if you haven't got the latest, the best, then you're falling behind. You're, you know, you're not, not up for it really, are you? you know, if, you're, if your phone is not the latest. I saw my, I had a new mobile phone recently, by the way, and part of the spur for me was I saw my previous mobile phone in a museum. It's absolutely true. I was going around a museum and in a case was actually the mobile phone that was in my pocket. So uh, it was one of those with a green screen and black writing. It was only a number of months ago that that happened. So uh, 
I've now been given someone else's second-hand phone because they've upgraded to the latest, and I've, I've now got one that's not quite in a museum yet, but it, it actually has got a colour screen, so amazing. So, Okay, what else about work? I'm just thinking of people at work who are quite happy in the way they're working, they're fulfilled in their jobs and things like that. Um, but the challenge for them is that people or their bosses may tell them, look, you have no ambition whatsoever. You need to do other things. And that's not really right, because if you're happy doing what you're doing, that's quite modest, really. Yeah. Yes, there is this push and drive, isn't there, um, for, for people to... Uh, there's a sense that you ought to be aiming to achieve, to do much more than you're doing. You ought to be working harder, which means longer, and all the rest of it. And there is, right, there is almost this sense among managers that people who are satisfied and content, they're actually not doing what they ought to be doing. Yeah? Um, there's a culture... Um in some companies, a lot of companies, where um, people, you know, go go to work, um, well, early, not as much as early, but they, they stay late when there's no reason. But a lot of the time, <laughs> I have anecdotal evidence, but that when they're there, they're not really sort of working full on. They spend time on Facebook and, and this and that and sort of... Is that a testimony? No, no. <laughs> but just, you know, our, our, Frank and I, our uh, sort of attitude is go there, work 100%, you know, but within like 15 minutes or whatever, you know, unless there's a task that immediately needs, and this is what Frank tells his staff, do what you're going to do while you're here, and that's it. You know, work hard in your hours for for fair work for fair pay but there is a culture that which frank sort of fights against that you've got to stay you know two hours late and all this but yeah it's to, it's to demonstrate that how important what you're doing is and all the rest of it that yeah yeah um the the challenge for me is how to um get a balance between um like in my workplace i line manage about 30 people, and they all have different work culture and attitude. So I have the group of people that are very committed, um, but will leave at five o'clock, and I have those that will go beyond the call of duty to do that extra mile. And then I have the minimalist, <laughs> the group I call the minimalist. And the challenge for me as a manager is how I manage that sort of diversity in attitude, in cultural, you know, work orientation and, and stuff. And the challenge also is what example you set as a manager, isn't it? I mean, that's, you know, for people who manage, um, they set the, uh, the, the culture, they set the, store, the, the standards, the, the, the values for, for the people. And so those of us who manage, and I put myself in that category, we, we need to be setting an example in what we do that creates a culture for the environment that we are that we're in okay i'm going to just take two more i'll be back to you in a moment um and this is a personal one it's dealing with vulgarities in the office and like imagine 10 hours of vulgar stuff and how it kind of stays with you even if you're not a part of it it's very hard thank you and finally before we move on yeah, talking about managers, I work for a manager who wants you to uh, be very efficient and be very productive in as short a time as possible, uh, do more work. Um, and he tells me that, you know, if I work an extra minute, he's not going to pay me for that. Whatever I need to do, I need to do it in the little time that I have. So there's a lot of pressure to be as productive as you were like 10 years ago with less resources and less time. I was talking to a, um, on Friday night to a senior manager in Ealing Council in uh, one of the departments there and uh, talking about this whole thing about still being expected to do the same work with now 25% of the staff in the department that they had five years ago and yet they're still expected to do the same amount of, of stuff. So there is that that is around as well. So the challenge for us 
for all of us is how we live our lives with contentment in that context. Because our goal, of course, our eyes are on heaven, not on earthly rewards. Not that there's anything wrong with earthly rewards, but actually amassing them is relatively pointless. It is what we do that's of eternal value that really matters. So it's getting that, that, balance, that balance right for us in that work context so that we work with contentment, we work with peace, we work hard because actually our boss, our real boss that we're really working for actually is God. So we do our very, very best for him. But it is also with that sense of contentment as well. Okay, so here's the other side of that. Uh, verse 7, total contrast. I saw something meaningless under a sun, under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. So here is a picture of a compulsive money miser, just compulsive money maker, just accumulating and accumulating for the sake of accumulating and not being satisfied with accumulation. You know, there's a sense, there's a, a, it's not, I don't think it's in the Bible, but there's a, a proverb that, that, that riches are a bit like salt water. The more you drink, the more thirsty you get. And the whole thing of work has impact in terms of relationships. Notice that in verse 8 here. There was a man all alone. And in this section of Ecclesiastes 4, we're going to focus around relationships. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. One of the themes that runs through the Bibles, not just in Ecclesiastes, is that God made us not to be inter, sorry, not to be independent, but to be interdependent. Being independent means that we stand in glorious isolation, believing that we can do it all ourselves. Being interdependent is recognizing that that isn't how God made us. God made us to be people that need other people, that need to connect with other people, to give and to receive. The loner is actually in relational poverty, whereas those in relationship have companionship that helps existence to have meaning. I'll say that again, companionship actually helps existence to have meaning. That phrase, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken, is often quoted uh, in the context of marriage. And it, it's often used to underlie what is true, that a marriage with God at the center is strong. So the idea you've like got this, this strong thread through the center and around that the lives of two people are woven together that is very strong and, and that is true I don't think that's quite what it means in this context but it it is a it is a fact that's true about marriage here it is more talking I think about the interweaving of lives with other people you know when when life gets tough and for all of us it does get tough at times doesn't it I mean, 
you may at the moment be having a tough season or your life may be fantastic and easy and wonderful. But I'm sure if that is the case for you at the moment, you can look back over the last few years and look at a time that has been much more difficult and more challenging and sticky. And when we're in genuine relationship with other people, it is those relationships that draw us through, help us through those difficult times, isn't it? Yeah? I could go round. I'm not going to. I could go around and ask lots of testimonies about that. But it's certainly true for me. When I, when I look back, you know, just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean that, that my life is swimmingly easy like everyone else. There are difficulties. There are challenges that come at me, not just in terms of ministry, but in terms of family life, in terms of circumstances and situations that are around me that at times are very, very difficult and hard. That's just normal life. That's just how life is. Uh, when I look back at, at those, and I've got one or two in my mind now, which I'm not going to share with you, but you know, situations that I've faced in the last two or three years that have been particularly difficult, it has been the friendships, the relationships that I have with other people within the leadership team here, people outside the church, that have helped me come through those really difficult times. Because... There is an interdependence in my life with other people. And so when life's difficult for me, almost naturally, almost instinctively, the people that are around me grab hold of me and help me come through that. And it works the other way around as well because we have that interdependence in, in our lives that is there. And that's how God has made us. And it's really important to get hold of this because it is actually against one of the values of our culture that is pushed and pushed and pushed strongly and strongly, more and more at the moment, which is this idea of, of self-sufficiency, of, of self-realisation, that, that somehow, you know, if we go on the right course, we read the right self-help book, we buy the right DVD and we watch this, that we can somehow come to a place where we are completely self-sufficient and we can stand up whatever is coming our way, whatever difficulty there is, that somehow, if we've done this, it's going to be okay. It's a lie. Because that's not how God's made us. That's not how God's made us. God has made us to be people who are interdependent. He's made us so we need other people. He's made us for relationship because he's made us in his image. And at the heart of the Godhead is the Trinity. And the Trinity is about relationship. Relationship is the heart and centre of God. That's why God looks for relationship with us and us with him. It's because he's a relational being. And he's made us in his image. So we are, guess what? We're relational beings. And significant and important relationships. Interdependence. And interdependence does mean some degree of vulnerability. Which again is something which our society thinks is a really bad thing. You know, we, we have to work to not, to be, um, not to be vulnerable to other people and to be strong and, and all of that. Now, I, you know, there's a sense in which we do need to be strong and a sense in which we you know, shouldn't be vulnerable in certain ways. But in interdependence, there is always a vulnerability. In relationship, there's always a vulnerability. C.S. Lewis, I think it was, uh, writing it. And I think this was the book that he wrote under, under a pseudonym. And it wasn't until many years later that... Um, it was the book, I think it's from the book of Grief Observed, which he initially had published under a pseudonym because it was an account of the death of his wife and how he felt about that. And uh, it was years later before it was discovered that he had written it. I think I'm getting my facts correct here. And I think it's in that book he talked about the only way of preventing your heart being broken 
is to take it and put it in a box and lock it away in a cupboard. Because in interdependence, in relationship, there is a vulnerability and there is hurt and there is pain. But there is also so much joy (laughs) and so much strength that is there. And here the writer is saying, and, and it's all the way through Old and New Testament, this whole thing of relationships and the importance of that is really, really important. So I just... I've said a bit more then than I intended to. Uh, so I don't know, you, I was going to ask a question at this point. I'll ask it anyway, but I've, in a sense, I've talked into the question a bit more than I'd intended. What, what can we learn from this passage about our own relationships? <laughs> I just wonder if anything else that's come out of that. I don't, I'm not asking you to repeat the things that I've just said. But anything, any of the challenges from here uh, that come to us in terms of our own relationships or lack of them and the values of our culture and society. Uh, It's okay not to be good at something if you've got friends. That's very true, very true, yeah. I was just thinking about the the emphasis on this culture about being an an individual and um, in control yourself or, or whatever. Um, and the whole of this scripture is, of course, it's describing life without God. Okay. Well, as we know, that the the, the 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 core thing is actually when you're with God, then you're not on your own. You're in relationship. So, yeah, it's just. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. It's a warning. It tells us, uh, or it reminds some of us who are perhaps prone to going to dark places that. When you feel like you don't want to see your friends, when you feel like you're utterly alone, and when you start pulling away from your friends, it's probably the time when you need to see, find, seek them most and be prepared to be vulnerable because that's when you need the most help. So if you're finding yourself pulling away, don't pull away and ask for a friend to just be with you today. That's very, very good because, again, our culture, part of our, the values of our culture says to us that if we're having a rough time, we shouldn't let people see that, so we should close the door and deal with it ourselves and again that's not how God has made us and that isn't the right way of doing it thank you very much anything else oh sorry Um, it also goes to show that um, having friends you're spiritually strong from what you've just said but mentally as well I mean that's a well-known fact that if you're alone now you don't do so well as someone who's got friends very good thank you and that theme's continue these next few verses, verses 13 through to 16. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all those who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. In this slightly complex uh, series of statements here, it's highlighting again the folly of being self-sufficient. The foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. You know, being wise in one's own eyes, refusing to listen to advice, is the height of foolishness. And there's no age limit on foolishness. There's no age limit on foolishness. So you've got the old king here, who's very foolish. And there is no lower age limit on wisdom. We tend to think, don't we, that you know, old people are wiser and young people, well, they're just young people. But here it's the youth that has the wisdom and the foolish king who has lost it. Okay, subject change. As we come into chapter 5, looking at these verse 7 verses. Uh, uh, 
subject change and also just a change of context because for these next seven verses, we're no longer under the sun. God has come out. So these verses are in the context of God. And some really profound lessons for us and for our culture in these last seven verses that we're going to look at in the uh, last 10, 15 minutes or so. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on the earth. So let your words be few. And there's a proverb here. As a dream comes when there are many cares. As you know, you've got a lot of stuff going on in your life. You have lots of dreams. So the speech of a fool comes when there are many words. So in the context of God here, so we're no longer under the sun. We're now under God. The writer's arguing for simplicity in speech. And if I was trying to put this into, in one context, in, in modern day terms, he talks here about people who go to the house of God, the temple. I wonder if we might think about the person who comes along to church. Uh, that's a good thing to do, by the way. I'm not saying you shouldn't come to church. But comes along to church and, and uh, enjoys singing the songs. Well, nothing wrong with enjoying singing the songs. Enjoys singing the songs and, and likes the atmosphere. But actually doesn't take the words terribly seriously. The words in the songs, the words in the prayers. It's very easy, isn't it, in the context of church sometimes to, to get all caught up in the, in the emotion and the movement and all of that. And nothing wrong with that, providing we stay also thinking about what we're saying, and what we're singing, what's going on in that context. There's a, uh, a verse I want to read to you from, from 1 Samuel. Um, it's just a single verse. You don't need to turn to it. It's 1 Samuel 15.22 if you do want to turn to it. Uh, I, I'm not going to explain the context. It's not relevant. I'm, I'm taking a little bit out of context here. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As much as in obeying the voice of the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. Which is talking about part of sacrifice there. You know, you know it's, it's doing God's will that matters. Listening obediently to God is what counts. Our culture these days is full of noise, isn't it? Just so full of noise. Um, some of you may feel that church sometimes is too full of noise. Maybe so. we will come back to that in a moment. But it's so full of noise. You, you can't these days even go into um, browsing a shop. I, I have been, uh, I don't think I'm alone in this, but, but waging a, um, a slight war with the supermarket that I use. Because I'm fed up with my ears being just pounded by music when I walk into the, into the supermarket. I'm not talking about quiet background music here. I'm talking about you know, speakers as you go in through the door just blaring out the music. It really, I don't like it at all. So I regularly go to customer services and ask them to turn it down. Or off, preferably, but at least down. Am I alone in that? 
It's just, just all of this. We just, just live in this, this context of noise all the time. It's just so much that is a part of our culture here. If, there is, if there's a bit of silence, it, our culture feels that somehow it's got to be filled with some noise. You know, when you've got two people who are in conversation together who really are good friends, they can sit in silence for five minutes and it's okay. They don't feel that someone's got to say something. And it should be like that with us and God. I think there's a real place for silence in church. There's a place for noise. There's a place for dancing and there's a place for loud music and all of that. But actually there's a place for silence too. Because sometimes we can have so much noise that actually we can't hear God in it all. So it's not either or, it's both and. And I think in our relationship with God, we need to have less speaking and more listening. Some of you will remember a piece of drama I did here years ago, um, based on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, you have someone out the front in the congregation um, just begins saying the Lord's Prayer, and then this voice comes over the speaker, which is God, who's trying to get their attention. But the person basically says, uh, not quite these words in the, in the skip, but basically saying, shut up, God, I'm praying. You know, they, they, they're so busy wanting to pray because uh, they, they've got five minutes and they've got to get this prayer in. And God is saying, um, I want to tell you something. I, w- I want to talk to you. I've got something to say, but they're just too busy. They do end up listening to God in, in, in the skit. But we can be a bit like that, can't we? In our prayer. In our time with God that we just want to fill it with words. We may want to fill it with words because we might not want to hear what God wants to say to us. Well, maybe we just not comfortable with silence, but that's a part there. So here, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Listening obediently to God is what really counts. We need to speak less. And listen to God more. We need particularly to speak less in this context. Verses 4 to 7. Final part that we're looking at this morning. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It's better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger saying, "Um, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. In this context here, a vow means a voluntary promise made to God. Now, some people, even modern day Christians use vows as a form of bribes how so pastor well it goes like this God if you do this then I promise that I will do that really don't think it's smart trying to bribe God really don't think that's terribly clever for all sorts of reasons, which could take me quite a long time to unpack. God takes us takes very seriously what we say. God takes very seriously what we say and what we promise. And we need to be careful with our words our words that we use towards him. We need to be careful that we don't speak without thinking. 
Two more quotes from this guy. I've quoted from a lot this morning. Um, I really found his comments on this passage really helpful. This guy Brown that I talked to earlier on. Simplicity in speech is key, for it reflects the integrity of the speaker and genuine reverence to God. Remember, God holds people accountable for what they say and do. A couple of moments, and it's just a couple of minutes we have. What can you learn? Make it personal. What can you learn? What can we learn from this passage about our words today? My final question for this morning. What do we take away from this? You're putting it into practice, aren't you? <laughs> Listen more, speak less. Absolutely. Were you waving at me? I thought you were. I, I suppose I'm stretching things very slightly here, but... Here it talks about as you enter the house of God. And we talk a lot about us being the church, being the body of Christ, wherever we are. And so this is not just about what we do on a Sunday morning here. This is about wherever we are, keeping our ears open and our mouths shut and thinking before we speak and making sure that what we do and say is honouring to God. Do you repeat that last sentence again? Because that's really important. So in whatever context we're in. Keeping our ears open and our mouths shut and, and making sure that what we do and what we say is as honouring to God outside of this building as we want it to be inside this building. So I just added that bit. Thank you. I don't think that's stretching it at all. Oops, sorry. Um, I think that's... Uh, Absolutely right. Okay, our time has virtually gone. Uh, key things that I think we should take away from this passage this morning. Uh, three things. Uh, work, and that phrase earlier on, modest demands, inward peace. Secondly, interdependence. God made us to need other people. And thirdly, that we need to be careful what we say. God takes our words seriously. Let's stand together if you're able to. Uh, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be silent for a moment, and so are you. Give you an opportunity to, in that silence to hear from God, to speak to God. Then in a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer together. Father God, we thank you for your living word. Thank you that it is absolutely relevant to our lives and situations. Father, help us, all of us, this week, whatever context we're in, to be people that live out these words. People of relationship. People careful with our words honouring to you at every moment in every place content in our work so Father God I pray for us as we go out into this week that it will be a week that in every context and place that we go we find ourselves that you are there with us in our lives working through us making a difference to the people around us because of your presence in us in Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.